Thank you everyone for coming out to this panel. I want to introduce our panelists. Um, to my uh, immediate left is Mike, si Mike Signer. He is Vice President and General Counsel of the digital product firm Willowtree, and he serves on its executive team. Uh, he is a member of the Charlottesville City Council and was mayor from 2016 to 2018. Uh, next to Mike is Melody Barnes. Melody Barnes is co-founder and principal of MB2 Solutions, a domestic strategy firm, uh, and a senior fellow and Compton visiting professor in world politics at the University of Virginia's Miller Center of Public Affairs. Uh, she was also, uh, before this, assistant to the president and director of the White House Domestic Policy Council from 2009 to 2012. And then uh, to Melody's left is Leslie Bowman. Leslie is president of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation at Monticello, uh, where she spearheads its vision to bring history forward in today's dialogues, emphasizing civic engagement, race, and slavery's legacies. All right, perfect panel to discuss what happened last year. <laughs> I think it's worth giving a quick refresher about what happened last year, if you don't quite remember. Uh, on August 11th, a group of white supremacists held a candlelight march or Torch, uh, torchlight march on the at the University of Virginia. The next day, that group and a larger group under the banner Unite the Right held a big demonstration uh, in Charlottesville's downtown. Um, it, it was a mess, and it ended uh, with the, the death of a young um, counter-protester, Heather Heyer. Uh, and since then, there's been all kinds of fallout and discussion and um, uh, criticism in the wake of that. And so to start our conversation, I wanted to ask, um, sort of the, the, the title of the panel is, is one year later, you know, uh, moving forward after, after August 12th, but do you think Charlottesville has actually moved forward? Um, there's just been a lot of turmoil in the city, so I'd be curious to hear what everyone thinks about that, that basic question. We can start with you, Mike. Okay, thanks. Well, it's great to be here, of course, um, and Jamel's a local, um, which is, um, Awesome, and um, so um, I kind of wanted to start off with a with a with a couple of background points. How many people here have been to Charlottesville? Oh, so wow. this is wow. this is very common, um, and I have a pet theory that one of the reasons that people ask why Charlottesville, why Charlottesville, we are a extremely progressive southern city. We voted for Bernie Sanders over. Hillary Clinton. Um, we have a major office of the International Rescue Committee that brings in over 100 Muslim political refugees who very happily, without much controversy, resettle in our borders, become our neighbors, and work in businesses. And um, we have the University of Virginia, which, which is trying very hard to become more diverse and innovative in lots of different ways. And we have um, Thomas Jefferson and Legacy Monticello, which is, uh, Leslie's doing great work to bring into the modern era. And so it's a very dynamic, progressive city, which is also a southern city, and which has been doing a lot of work to come to terms with a past common to many southern cities, but Charlottesville has its own awfulnesses and cruelties that are in our past that have a lot of harm associated with them. And so we started a project to try and tell the truth about race in Charlottesville and try and change the narrative. And that happened in a city that also is very famous and that virtually everybody here has been to and knows about. So those two things combined to put us on the map for a lot of forces that have been newly emboldened in this political era to not want the narrative change, to not want the truth told about race, and not want this this kind of tarp lifted off of lots of passages in our past that have been hidden. So a couple other um, points I just wanted to make before we get into the discussion, and to get to, to, get to Jamel's question. Um, the, there's a couple things about the government in Charlottesville that uh, that a lot of you probably don't know that are useful to point out because they do go to some of the questions you're raising about how far have we progressed. We have a um, part-time citizen legislator, a former government, where the mayor and the four other members of city council serve part-time. And you can thank Thomas Jefferson and his people around him for this design of government. Our delegates and senators are also like this in Virginia. We've got a full-time city manager who is the CEO of the government who commands all operational aspects of the government, including policing and communications. The city council is a policy-making and budgetary body. Um, and so my job, the stipend, you know, it's a very intense job, but the stipend that you get paid to be mayor in our city did not cover our daycare bills for our two, three-year-old 
twin boys. Um, so I have a, a day job like we talked about, and I actually have a second day job which goes to this kind of hidden life that I have, which is before I got a law degree, I got a PhD in political science with a focus on political theory, and my topic there went back to this personal fascination that developed very early on. I was a you know, Jewish kid growing up in very waspy northern Virginia, and I started, for whatever reason, becoming fascinated by what had happened in Weimar Germany, where a democracy turned against itself at the hands of a demagogue and destroyed itself, took a lot of the civilized world down with it, and that, you know, we're at an ideas festival. That idea, how can a democracy turn against itself, really captivated me. And um, it led, you know, I wrote a dissertation about this problem, about what is democracy's demagogue problem, what I wrote a play at one point and produced a play with a, it was sort of modeled on um, It Can't Happen Here by Sinclair Lewis. This was like when I was 24 years old in graduate school, a very different chapter of life. But that idea, so it was, it was a very odd situation I found myself in being the mayor of the city with, I have argued, a, a, a candidate who chose the tactics historically of demagogues to work his, you know, to create a populist political campaign premised on white nationalism, joining up with the Republican Party, working its way into the White House, and then a lot of those forces unleashed come to my city. And my feeling and the argument of my dissertation was that the demagogue problem is solved from within the citizenry of a democracy by constitutionalism. So people are the antidote to the demagogue problem. If people are vested in the norms and the mores of a healthy constitutional democracy, they can solve the problem on their own. That's a de Tocqueville, Arendt, kind of, for any of you poli sci 101, <laughs> going back, um, argument, but it is very, it's very true. It goes to what happened in this nation through McCarthyism and Jim Crow. When we have these stress tests, we can bounce back stronger than before, but it can be very frightening, it can be very bloody, it can be violent, and it is a dynamic process, but if the country and the, the underlying culture is strong enough, then we can come through it even stronger than before. That's what happened in Charlottesville, and that question is still happening right now. I think there's a lot of evidence that we will come out in a stronger place than before, <coughs> But this stress test has been very bloody. It's been extremely frightening. The city is traumatized. The people are traumatized, not just the people who like, witnessed a car attack on the downtown mall. There were thousands of people who, saw, who, who were verbally abused, who, who witnessed things that they thought that we had passed by in our country. Um, and, it's, and, there's, and there's a ton of trauma, I think. That the, and not to mention there was a, a, kind of a scandal of um, of, of policing and security, which we can talk more about. And dealing with that, working that out, why that happened, what are the consequences for the government, are, are painful, very difficult questions. But in my, my belief is they go to the core question of how do we evolve out of this test. You know, a broken bone is strongest where, where it's broken, where it mends. The, I, I believe all those metaphors get to something true, but they are very painful to go through um, while they're happening. So that. That's, that's how I feel about it. Melody? My answer is the answer my con law professor used to give me in law school, yes and no, <laughs> which was really helpful when you were studying for an exam. Um, it, has Charlottesville moved forward? I would say no, picking up on some of the things that Mike just said in being there, and my husband and I live in Richmond, Virginia, which is about an hour and 10 minutes from Charlottesville, but I spent the past year teaching at the law school and also involved with the Miller Center. And the trauma that you can feel and hear in the conversations there is still very, very present. Uh, so no, in that way, people have not, Charlottesville has not moved forward. Um, no, in the sense that the, some of the institutional and structural, structural issues that predate last August by centuries um, still exist. I mean, there is a part of Charlottesville, and for those of you who have visited, my guess is you may not have gone to the part of the city known as Vinegar Hill. Um, but Vinegar Hill, when you talk to locals about Charlottesville, is something that people immediately bring up. At one point, it was the center of black commercial life in Charlottesville. And in the 1960s, it was just plowed, plowed over. 
and as part of a new urbanization, quote unquote, um, project. And those kinds of acts um, by the government uh, still have long tentacles um, and great friction that exist in Charlottesville and as exists in many places between a university and the city in which it resides or the town in which it resides, there are long-standing frictions between the university and the city and issues of workers' rights, um, issues of slavery, uh, issues of uh, labor-related and segregation-related issues, the, the public schools, and when you've got an excellent university, one of the best public universities in the country, and at the same time, significant inequities in the public school system. All of those things still exist. At the same time, the yes part, uh, and this may be a, a tweak on a yes, but the reason I also say yes is because Charlottesville, because it is now f focusing on and grappling with what happened a year, almost a year ago, um, and issues that had predated that but were engaged, the community was engaged with in the months prior, I think is now focused in a way many other places in the country are not but should be focused on these issues. And that, and that goes I think to some of your concluding comments a minute ago, gives the community an opportunity to move forward when you really have to start to wrestle with and grapple with the truth that many communities just refuse to do. And I think the, the nation in many ways refuses to do. I'm going to be Jeffersonian and optimistic. Um, and I'm going to say I think Charlottesville is moving forward, but it's, um, to quote my friend Melody Barnes even from last weekend, it's a few steps backward, something forward, then backward, then forward. Um, I think we're in a healing crisis, that J curve, where we're going to just have to go down before we can come up. And I don't think it's a quick process. I mean, I think we've only just started down in this year, and I don't know how much longer it's going to be before we can start to say, hey, we're really, you know, we're really coming up. But I think there are some signs of coming up that are really important. Um, I think you've both articulated why we're coming down, and I think it has to do with the truth. I think we can't heal till we get at the truth. That's, you know, Brian Stevenson says, right? You, you can't have reconciliation and healing until you get to the truth. And I think Monticello's on that same journey of getting to the truth on that mountain, which looms over Monticello, literally, right? Jefferson is there, the largest figure in Charlottesville's history. And what does he stand for? He stands for equality and justice for all and pursuit of happiness, and he owns 607 men, women, and children. So you have this paradox that's right there, that's in DNA of Charlottesville. And I think that the events of last summer ripped open wounds that had been shunted aside, gone under the rug, the cancer was there, but nobody was really openly saying, wait, wait, wait. Um, this, yes, a lot of people wanted to say, oh, this all came from outside and was visited on Charlottesville. There's some truth to that. But what it opened up is absolutely about Charlottesville and the Jim Crow past and the massive resistance and Vinegar Hill being you know, raised and Monticello for years um, saying that we had servants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Imagine that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and you know, it's only been since probably 1993 we actually acknowledged slavery on a tour. So you know, I think these things take time. But I, I, think, there is, I think there is real hope that we are we are in the midst of these conflicts and openly talking about them. And I think the fact that um, there is a Charlottesville delegation going down to Montgomery July 8th, you know, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, and every community that had a lynching has been invited to come and get their memorial. And we had a lynching in Albemarle County, and I'm here to tell you, I don't think most residents in Charlottesville knew that. Um, before Brian began this process and before last summer. So July 8th, there were folks from Monticello, from the city, from the university, are all on that bus taking that soil down. And I think that begins a year that's going to progress on this healing crisis. So I went to the, the Mass Memorial <coughs> Peace of Justice right before it opened and, and saw, saw the structure and experienced the museum. And the interesting thing about it is that right, it exists just a stone's throw from the state capital of Alabama. It's in that way kind of this like weird provocation to the historical memory in the area. And people, there are plenty of people in Montgomery who are upset about this, right? Who look at this, this project of memorialization of peace and healing and they say, why, why bring this up? Why, why are we doing this? And I wonder, um, for, since all, all of you are very much engaged in the community in Charlottesville, 
there, there is an effort to heal and to come to terms, but is there any resistance to that? Is there any sort of, um, you know, uh, saying we've had enough trauma? Why do we have to bring up these old wounds? Why do we have to bring up things that are, are, have long since gone past? Anyone can answer that. Yeah, I, that's, that's a national dialogue that is taking place. People are tired of talking about it, tired of healing about it, hearing about it. Why can't we just get past it? But you can't get past what you haven't acknowledged, and you can't get past or deal with or move forward that which you, don't, you really know nothing about. There is so much history that shouldn't just be understood for history's sake. That is important. I was a history major. But it also has to be understood to understand how every single point connects to another. It's 400 plus years of history that connects and helps us understand why we are here today. It goes back to the you can't have reconciliation, truth and reconciliation without the truth. Um, and I think part of the challenge is not only is how do you move past the resistance to the conversation, the fragility to even having and engaging in that conversation, which as I've heard others describe it, is its own form of bullying. It's like, I don't want to have that conversation, we should move past it, which then prevents the conversation. But also, how do you do that in a way that just doesn't end up being a finger pointing exercise, but one in which we can honestly understand that we are collectively, as a country, in this together. This architecture that was created, this DNA that was created 400 plus years ago of land and capital and labor, cheap or free, and supremacy, we're all locked in this together. So it is incumbent upon all of us to collectively try to work our way out of this. And it, it, it is the healthy thing for us to do. And it will also unleash wonderful things for the country as opposed to what we're seeing unleashed today. Yeah. Um, I would actually say I don't think there's a lot of resistance inside. So Charlottesville is a small city. It's yeah. less than 50,000 people. And like as a day-to-day -day civic discussion thing, I actually have not heard all that much of people saying, can't we just be done with this? Which makes sense because of the enormity of the event that happened. I mean, we had you know, hundreds and hundreds of, of neo-fascists, literal neo-Nazis, white supremacists with, like, like that people might not have known unless you had studied it, that they really were out there, except in maybe pockets of militia movements out there, but you had them come from 31 states in a really well thought through and strategized event that was called Unite the Right, <laughs> where that was, that was happening, and keep in mind, there were a couple other events in Charlottesville that happened as precursors right. to this. So this all, there was a year of events that happened before this. There was Richard Spencer, some of you might know. Um, I hesitate to say his name because every time we talk about some of these people, they add to their, the celebrity that they want, but it's important just like as a documentary thing. So he invented the term alt-right. He runs this National Policy Center. He really uh, is a standard bearer for the new white nationalism that you're seeing now. He, as a UVA graduate, um, so loved these homecomings that he would do. And he did a rally um, in this, this kind of local alt-right blogger guy who really kicked up a lot of this at the very beginning around the debate around the Lee statue, sort of connected Charlottesville to this national system of all these people who wanted to unite the right in the, in the wake of the Trump victory. And uh, so there was this rally that Richard Spencer did in May where there were 100 people who came at the base of the Lee statue with tiki torches at night, and they were all dressed in this very eerie outfit with these buzz cuts and these white Oxfords and khakis, and it was, uh, and they were chanting, Russia is our friend, they were chanting, there was some Jews will not replace us chanting, I believe, going on, and it was, the images were unbelievably frightening. And so that happened first, and then there was the KKK from North Carolina came in, in June, and then that led to this you know, so that, that was this mounting kind of series of events that brought us, so Charlottesville is reeling from these, these like extraordinary events and the terrorist attack that happened. Um, so I believe that there's been, you know, pretty widespread belief and not trying to hasten it. I, I've found, you know, my time in local government, one of the interesting things, and at a very high level, at the federal level, is, is 
you know, the policy making machine is like a, it's like a machine with different gears and they move at different speeds. So a lot of the time people want something, some gears are moving much faster than others and they all work together. And one of the challenging things to the government official is to <laughs> explain this is gonna be addressed in the budget cycle in six months. <laughs> This is this media cycle. This with social media, we needed to address this yesterday, and we haven't. And I think one of the things that's happening in Charlottesville is there is a healing process. That if you look at other post-traumatized society where there have been Trump, you know, terrorist attacks or things like this, it can take a long time for people just to feel at ease in their day-to-day -day lives. Meanwhile, it's been challenging in government because there are things that we're doing, like we, one of the, you know, to, to go to your point, what's happened, um, we did a lawsuit with Georgetown University as a new institute for constitutional advocacy and protections. The city of Charlottesville and a number of local plaintiffs joined um, in a lawsuit against about over a dozen of the paramilitary groups that came to Charlottesville it's very interesting legal theory. So 41 states have provisions in their constitutions or their codes that prevent an unorganized militia from operating without the permission of the civilian authority. These have never needed to be enforced before. So they're kind of sitting there in the books, but they're there for the reason that the state needs to have a monopoly on force. And so when you start to see that not happen anymore, you're getting into real dangerous territory. So we and these groups that came here conducted themselves like organized paramilitary groups. They had command structures, they had insignia, they had weaponry, they, sent, they went on into sorties in the neighborhood, they planned on the dark web beforehand. Uh, they had like military style planning. So um, we did a lawsuit to enjoin them from coming back to Charlottesville again in groups of two or more constituted as a unpermitted mil militia. And there's been, I think, 11 or 12 settlements so far which have resulted in legally enforceable agreements to prevent them from doing this sort of thing before. That's a really important innovation. It's kind of like, it's not as flashy of a one that as the, the cycle of the agonies that we still hear in city council meetings or lots of other places where people are visibly speaking out in very uncivil terms, but, but true ones, their emotions about what happens, what has happened. But there are, there are works afoot um, to try and, and, and deal with what, with what we've seen. I'm gonna talk about a slightly different form of resistance. Um, there's no question that the racial tensions that flared, as I said, kind of go right back to the founding. And as we move Monticello to follow Jefferson's words, follow the truth, wherever it may lead, right? And, and tell the stories of everybody on that mountain and begin to put the landscape of slavery back, we did encounter resistance. We lost donors. We also gained donors, right? Um, but I, I think what's interesting to think about when you look at a UNESCO World Heritage Site like Monticello, it's one of the few places you can go anymore where the dialogue and the conversation on the tour is gonna be a cross-section of America. You don't get to choose your tour group at Monticello, like you can choose your church, or you can choose your school, or you can choose your grocery store, right? You're on a tour group, and we're driving dialogue. We're not just like telling you the facts, right? We're, we're engaging our visitors, in, and when they say, well, I don't want to take the slavery tour, that's their history. We say, well, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Have you thought about how America became a world power in such a short time? Did you understand what our economy is resting on, right? And so that resistance plays out every day with 450,000 people a year at a place like Monticello in quiet ways. But that resistance is part of that dialogue, and I think that's healthy. So Charlottesville being small, Charlottesville being um, fairly progressive, um, people kind of broadly being on the same page, does make these conversations a little easier. It does make things a little smoother. But if we're sort of looking at Charlottesville, not just at its own place, but as in some ways a microcosm of things happening at the country at large, um, uh, it, it appears that we're still a long way away from having the kinds of conversations we need to have. Um, just the past two weeks, I think, are uh, in, indicative of that. So kind of bridging Charlottesville to the national moment when kind of white nationalism is still kind of in, in the political air where there is, you know, arguably like a humanitarian crisis of our own making happening at the border that ties into all these, all these uh, questions. What, what do you think that, like what, what applicable lessons can we draw from Charlottesville? Um, given both the connection, but also just this, the, the real difference between the kind of place we are and the kind of place the country is, where there is a lot more resistance, where 
the, the government isn't really aligned at the moment with trying to move forward from, from some of this. So there is a live experiment happening right now about our present democracy's ability to digest what happened in Charlottesville and what the reaction to it is going to be. And it's been happening in Virginia. And it, it really has been incredible to watch. So there's tons of evidence for pessimism, tons of evidence for optimism. In, in, and, and some of that is going to depend not on kind of our just observation. It's on what we do. You make your own case for optimism in a democracy, I think. But so Virginia had elections statewide right after Charlottesville. We're, we, have, we're the only, we, we have elections every year in Virginia. We've got off year, we, we just have elections every year. So there, there's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a quirky state. We have the only one-term governorship. We've got a lot of quirky things about Virginia. So um, we, had, we had statewide elections in the fall, not for governor and for um, the House of Delegates, every member of the House of Delegates. And the, um, there was, so Ed Gillette, so Corey Stewart, who now is the Republican nominee for US Senate, running against Tim Kaine, the VP nominee from last year, two years ago, um, is, uh, was a candidate for the Republican governorship in the Republican primary and ran a campaign almost entirely about the issues that surfaced in Charlottesville, including after Unite the Right rally. He didn't let up, well, he lost the primary before Unite the Right, but um, he now has come back to those themes. So he really was interested in white nationalism, uh, taking photos next to rebel flags, I think identifying what we're seeing on the other side, which is a source of electoral intensity in white nationalism among this part of the base and just kind of very clinically going after it, which disgusts me, but it kind of, you need to take it as it is. So you had a real like battle between forces of good and evil, I, I believe, in electoral politics in Charlottesville. And Ed Gillespie, who got the nomination, ran, basically took up the mantle and ran on Confederate pride and ran on a lot of these uh, on anti-immigrant issues and a lot of these bell whistles and was delivered a resounding defeat in the fall in a purple state by a v electrified electorate on the other side who turned out at like 3x their normal intensity and it was extraordinary to watch. There were dozens of these pop-up groups. The New York Times did an after action kind of report about Prince William County uh, which is this very diverse outer suburban county. And not only did um, Ralph Northam win, who kind of was like an antidote to all of our fears about the direction of, of our politics today, because he's this fairly soft-spoken, like pragmatic, thoughtful, real evidence-based doctor who got into politics. And he, like, he just doesn't mirror anything of, that we're worried about in our politics today. But there was such a wave against this Anti, this post-Charlottesville you know, um, demagoguery that uh, all these candidates were swept into a gerrymandered House of Delegates, and which was 68, uh, 32, I think, Republicans and Democrats, even though our state had voted, for, you know, Democrats for president three times in a row, had, had all these Democratic statewide elected officials, but we had a, we had a map that was, that was engineered to stop an electoral wave, and the electoral wave still overtook it, and the Democrats now are down one in the House of Delegates. And, all of these very progressive candidates won because of the civic discussion that was happening after Charlottesville. So th there is real cause for optimism about the democracy's ability to, to deal with and the people's ability to deal with what, what we're seeing, we're seeing today. But none of it is coming easy. Part of the coda to that story, though, we have to acknowledge is that Corey Stewart is now the Republican nominee right. for the exactly. states for the United States. Which is Senate. why it's not easy. Right. Yes. Exactly. Um, I think one of the lessons to be learned is, for the country is the lesson that I think the country should not take from Charlottesville. And Leslie is exactly right that what happened has led Charlottesville to grapple with some of the things that have happened in Charlottesville. But what I have also found, and I remember last year, August 11, 12, and I was in Seattle for a meeting, but I did a CNN interview. And there was a response to something I said then that I'll say now and still to be believed to be true, which is that people think about this as a Charlottesville problem. People think about this as a Southern problem. And it is neither. It is an American problem. It is a problem that sits on the American DNA that we have to grapple with and we have to deal with. 
And that requires, it goes back to everything that we've talked about in terms of truth. And, and so that's one lesson that I hope the country will start to understand, as opposed to taking what I believe is the easy way out to say, well, you know how they are in the South. <laughs> and that's just the way it is. And not looking around and seeing memorials and named buildings and all the, 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 the symbols not to mention the institutional and structural problems that exist around the nation. So that's one. Um, two, you were talking about the present day crisis. Um, because the other thing that we, often do, uh, we also often do is we say, this isn't who we are. And I say this as a woman who is an American, and I am proud to be an American, full stop. However, this is part of who we are as Americans. And I, and I say that, I say that because one, if you tie together the, the crisis that we've been witnessing on, on the border for the last couple of weeks, let's attach that to history. History where enslaved children were sold from their parents. A history where American Indian children were taken away from their parents so that we could de-Indian them. We've done this before. So I think the question is, what do we learn from that? When do we finally learn from that? And the, the challenge to us all is to build the America that is true to the principles of liberty and tolerance and pluralism and equality. We have to create that. We have to build that. The beauty is that the framers, for all of their faults, also gave us that. They gave us a way out. They gave us the ability to perfect, and they expected perfection in terms of perfectibility in the country. We need to grab hold of that and do something with it to create the America that lives up to those promises. So I, I agree with everything you said. I, I think if we also think about the founders and the framers, they did something that if we can bring forward into today's tensions would be a lesson for Charlottesville and for the nation and that's to listen. We have lots of stories to listen to one another, and we have stories from our past, and we're very good right now at being in our echo chambers. But Hamilton and Jefferson had to listen to one another. Washington had a cabinet that didn't agree, but they had to listen to each other and find a way. Now, there was a, a high risk. They knew they were going to hang if they didn't listen to each other. But maybe we should think about where are we going to go as a country if we don't start listening and just prescribing. I mean, one of the things that happened in Charlottesville and continues to happen is there's a real resentment about everybody coming in to tell us how to fix it, acting like it's Charlottesville's problem, right? And we're, we're going to help you. We're going to come in and bring you the answers on collaboration and listening. And, and yet, um, we have to, in our communities, listen to ourselves and begin to get across some of this polarity. So I think at this point, it's time for a uh, question and answer session before we get the Q&A. First, just a round of applause for the panelists who are amazing. Um, I believe there will be someone with a mic. Um, so just raise your hand, and I will call on you and try to keep your questions, you know, question length, because you don't have a ton of time for Q&A. So yes, ma'am, in the green, and then you. Right next, right next, and then up front. Thank you for the panel. Um, I'm interested and a bit surprised that nothing, uh, no one has mentioned, the subject has not arisen uh, about our president's reaction and comments after Charlottesville. Doesn't that have an impact? It certainly does outside of Charlottesville. What about within? Anyone? Well, I think his comments were um, startling to everyone in Charlottesville and to the nation. And, and I think Charlottesville um, came out in, in pretty strong terms against those comments, as did the media. I, I, how does it affect the healing process? Or, or how does it affect the healing process? That's a, I, I don't know. I mean, it's sort of like at a right angle to the healing process. It was one of the biggest parts of the, um, I, I mean, I, you know, so 
it, it added to the pain and it added to the egregiousness and I think made the event probably more historic in certain ways and it certainly had consequences. So if you take it on that lens, like you can see it that way, um, it, it also, it told us a lot about the thinking within the administration. I thought that it was incredibly helpful for history to see, oh yes, there actually was a bargain between this political campaign and this movement and these forces that would lead to some inhibition about condemning them out of, out of hand. Like that, so that was helpful to learn. It was, um, I think that politically speaking and for the democracy itself, I think that it also, in, what happened the next day so I think there were like 400 rallies. The Unite the Right on Saturday was the 12th. That was when the, the actual event happened and when the, ter the car attack was. And then the next night on Sunday, I believe, there were like 400 rallies around the country in, in sympathy with Charlottesville. And I don't think that there would have been nearly as many or they would have been as loud or as big if he hadn't had made those uh, extraordinary comments. And then if you look at what, so inside the city of Charlottesville, was, it was a huge deal. But we were still dealing, it was kind of like not as big of a deal as the fact that we had had 1,000 neo-Nazis come to the town and, and somebody, you know, three people die. Um, but in terms of the, and then you look, Steve Bannon was out that next week. I mean, I, I, I thought it was, it was really significant. And if one, the president's comments breathe life into and continue to breathe life into this movement. And the problem, and there are many, or a problem, is that his comments were consistent with what he had been saying mm -hmm. for two years, he, inciting violence at his own rallies, mm -hmm. othering people, women, people of color, and others, I mean, it, this isn't my opinion. These are the facts when we look at the list of statements. And one of the most powerful things that a president has, and I say this having worked for a president and people in the room could have loved and hated things Barack Obama said, but that president and those before him is that presidents understand the power of the bully pulpit. It is one of the most powerful tools that a United States president has. Presidents, you know, they can sign bills into law, but, you know, they don't pass laws. They don't determine constitutionality, the Supreme Court. You know, the list goes on and on of the things that the presidency does not include. The framers decided so for many, many reasons. But one of those powerful weapons, one of those powerful tools is the bully pulpit. And to stand and to articulate a vision for the country that is healing, that is forward-looking, that brings us together, that speaks to unity and an American identity that is both diverse and inclusive, is one of the most important things that a president can do. And again, people will disagree with the words of presidents before that, but the equivocation around what happened and the forces that came to Charlottesville that day, I think spoke volumes continues to, but is consistent with what happened has, and has happened for a couple of years now. There is a question you know, right there. Hi, um, so I'm a Virginian from the waspish side in Northern Virginia, and I'm a mother of three, and a year, well, almost a year ago when what happened in Charlottesville happened, I had planned a trip to Shenandoah. We were gonna make our way out west, and um, I have my three young children with me, and I wanted to memorialize what happened help them understand, and um, we came with flowers, and we wanted to leave them somewhere meaningful. And uh, the place that we left them at was at the feet of Thomas Jefferson, because that's where everyone was leaving flowers and doing candlelight vigils. And it felt wrong to me at the time, and what I really want, and I have an idea or a wish, not so much a question, is for Charlottesville to have some form of a monument for you know, the truth, right, of what happened in Charlottesville, to honor enslaved peoples to to recognize you know the pain and the suffering and to be a place for us to pilgrimage to to honor history and to help our children who are so impressionable you know see it for themselves and so I just wonder on the almost forthcoming anniversary of what has happened what plans Charlotteville has to address this or commemorate those who were who have suffered and are still suffering and I'm curious about that and 
you know, as we talk about art in the public square and I attended the yeah. Four Freedoms event last night, the, the town meeting, one thing I really wanted to see was permanent works of art, not just sort of fleeting social, you know, billboards that are really meaningful too, but something we can come back to year after year. Like I take my kids to the MLK monument in DC. Why aren't there more places like that? And so anyway, it's yeah. not maybe a fair question for all of you, but an idea. Well, I think that um, it's not going to happen on this anniversary, but I actually think that what is happening in relationship to the National Memorial in Montgomery is the beginning of that process, right? Bringing that memorial back um, around what happened in Albemarle County with that lynching, it's not just a memorial that's about that lynching. It's about everything that you're mentioning. And I think that the reason the process has to take the time it does is in most communities, they're just gonna deal with that, right? Well, Charlottesville's dealing not only with that lynching and its history and its Jim Crow sins, but it's also dealing with what happened last summer, right? So I think that, again, we're in that J curve, but I think that Charlottesville is very much on a path to use that and to use the dialogue to, 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 to memorialize a different, a different era and to remember those who have been forgotten. And I, I I would just say consistent with that, one of the things that I think we can all do is to go home to our communities and to understand what's happened there um, and the work that must happen there and the places that we need to commemorate in, in our own communities uh, so that we can build something stronger and better in the kind of world that, that you're articulating. One, two, uh, one of the things not mentioned, and I'm very proud of it, I sit on the board of trustees um, uh, for Monticello, for the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. And one of the things that we're planning for there, um, as we do all the work that Leslie described um, on the mountaintop, is to create a contemplative site there, a place where people can think through everything that they have learned and have understood um, about Jefferson, about the enslaved families that live there, after going through our new exhibit uh, on Sally Hemings' life there, after walking Mulberry Row, you know, both th the challenge, um, th the crime against humanity that was slavery, um, but also the call to liberty, uh, Jefferson's work around religious freedom. So to sit and to contemplate all of that and what they've just seen but also what we all must do. I just wanted to, it's a really good question. I just wanted to add on, that this, these are happening, they just take a while. So what actually um, triggered some of this was a vote by the city council on a resolution to overhaul these two parks that were put in place in the Jim Crow era with a statue of, Stonewall, of, of, General, of Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. Um, one part of those, which was the removal, it's comp too complicated to go into, but there's a state statute that creates complexity around whether you can <laughs> remove th these monuments. And there's litigation immediately and an injunction. But the part that is about overhauling the parks and adding new memorials and new interpretation is that was actually passed and the RFPs, what the RFP went out, we have four responses back. So that'll, that, it just will take a while to do these things right. Um, but to do it the right way could hopefully make it exactly what you're envisioning. We um, renamed a street, Heather Heyer, Honorary Heather Heyer Way. So actually, if you were looking for it, there's this beautiful, very organic chalk um, and flower memorial right on 4th Street um, where, the, where, the accident, where, the, where the attack happened. Um, and there's, there's, there's a lot of other, the UVA has put in place a, new, their, a memorial to the enslaved laborers mm -hmm. there, which, is, which has taken years to put. It's, it's remarkable, it's gonna be this orb kind of in this very contemplative area of, of grounds. Um, so, but again, the gears of these things don't necessarily satisfy somebody who want, you know, we want something right now. And that's what the Heather Heyer Memorial, which sprung up on the street has served. And if I, if I can add one little thing to that, I would really recommend actually going to the website for the NASA Memorial for Peace and Justice, because they do, they have a, a map that show you where all the lynchings they've recorded happen. And you could probably find you know, um, where you live in Northern Virginia, almost certainly one happened there. And just sort of uh, 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 using that as an opportunity to spur, to spur a discussion, I think would be really, really powerful and really important. Yes. Hi, uh, I always get a little concerned when we label places or people progressive because I have found that they tend to be no less racist than anywhere else. And in fact, they often stand in the space of saying, we're good people. 
right? And so then I think about the things that have happened recently with Barbecue Becky and Permit Patty and people say the Bay Area and clutch their pearls and say, wow, it's the Bay Area. This place is supposed to be so progressive. How can mm. these things happen here? So the concern that I have and a question I have for you is, in Charlottesville, what is the plan to deal with and to create the space for the individual work that's necessary to shed racist ideas um, and to stop people from wanting to engage in racist behaviors. Because while we can have monuments, we can have gatherings, we can have you know, even truth and reconciliation, this requires individual work. So is there a plan to help people to do the individual work so that they don't escape into their progressiveness? It's a great question. Um, I think that when enormous challenges like that are raised, a lot of the time I like to have a conversation about what are the ideas that, that you have about changing the, the, the culture and the history of a city individually. Like one of the things we did do was we um, put in a place, uh, th there, there have been three community-wide um, um, implicit bias trainings that have been run by a, um, a, a a guy, a, a, an expert in the field, including for city staff, because there's a lot of questions about city staff, um, and they've also been open to the community. Um, there is an entirely new focus on um, injustice and equity, and the way, like one of the, you know, some of these things are very, don't seem, I think, as big as they are, but the, the mayor now, as an African-American woman who grew up in city housing, who I, I seconded her nomination to become mayor, um, my, I did a, a, a term, which was the, the custom we have, and um, she grew up, she, you know, she won a huge vote total, independent votes, and there was a lot of people who wanted to see this, um, a, new, a new focus on equity, and we worked together and on, on something that basically erases the property tax that you're charged if you're in a low, which applies to people in the lower income housing tracks, which were the subject of redlining and are where the effects of gentrification and that implicit kind of white superiority has been hit the, the hardest. And we like tripled or quadrupled the amount of tax right off that you get if you're under a certain income, which almost erases the some of the property bill of these folks who live there. And that is an effort, you know, it's not necessarily glamorous, but it really does directly go at the structural racism of of a growing, booming college town where a lot of the time the economic effects of gentrification are just gonna flow down and you say there's nothing we can do about it. And this was something that, that, that we worked on um, and I don't think it would have happened if we didn't have our eyes open and weren't thinking about how policy can effect more equitable outcomes for people who have previously just been totally unhelped um, in the past. So. You know, I think it's messy. I think it's it's not a campaign that you can say, oh, it's all, you know, here's a bow and we're going to put it out and this is how it's all going to change. But I see more effort um, across various Charlottesville organizations, sometimes right hand, left hand, but it's it's happening. Um, for example, we're, we're, we continue to have diversity inclusion training for all 400 of our staff and we started it a year ago. We've done it with our board. We're, we're continuing to work on it. I mean, you know, so within our own sphere, we're trying to we're also mounting more programs. There is a host of programs across Charlottesville. There are so many. I think you, if you throw a stone anywhere in Charlottesville, you'll find that somebody's been trying to mount a program that relates to racism or the monuments or injustice. Um, it's not as well coordinated as we might like it to be. But on the other hand, I, I see organizations coming together that haven't before. The Clergy Collective is doing more with um, Monticello and other organizations than, I mean, Two years ago, I wouldn't have not even known the Clergy Collective was interested in these conversations. Um, we had a recent delegation go to Ghana. Now, we have a sister city in Charlottesville, Winneba. And you know, every other year, there's an obligatory trip between these two cities. Um, the former mayor usually leads it. 12 to 15 people go. There were 56 people on this trip. Monticello sent three. Um, it was 60% African American, 40% white. So, you know, those conversations that Mayor, Mayor Walker went with us, that was unprecedented. So, I, I, can we, you know, do we have classes in how to not be progressive? N no, but I, but I think there are conversations and heightened, um, heightened sensitivities that are certainly happening across the city, but then I'm an optimist, so. <laughs> Melody, do you have a, a last thought? No, the, I guess the only other thing I would add to that is I agree with you. I think we have to get past the 
it could never happen here, it could never be us, and deal with the relationship issues simultaneously with dealing with the structural and institutional issues. Because it isn't just about us being able to be in community with one another one-on-one -on -one or three-on-three. -three. It is also how do we disrupt and dismantle what has been created as an institutional matter that creates the outcomes that we're talking about and some of the challenges that you were talking about addressing, some of the things that we at Monticello hope that our work can help um, to serve as provocation for. So it is, it's a both and. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for attending. Thank you to the panelists.